Hello, this is Brother Cromar from the Math Department at BYU Idaho, and uh, these videos will be covering inference for two means independent samples. And so here's the outline for these videos. First, I'll introduce what independent samples are. Then I'll follow up with how to do hypothesis testing with independent samples, following up by confidence intervals, and then wrapping it up with checking requirements for independent samples. Okay, so first of all, dependent versus independent samples. Dependent samples is what we dealt with back in the previous lesson where we did the pair sample t-test or the match pair t-test. But in this, going back to the previous lesson, individuals in one sample are used to determine the units or individuals that be in the second sample. For instance, are sons taller than dads? If we were to pose this question, if we randomly choose the sons, then the fathers are automatically selected. Okay. But for independent samples, individuals in one sample do not dictate which units or individuals are to be in the se second sample. So say, for instance, in a stats class, if we wanted to do, say, uh, end, of, end of semester exam, we wanted to compare who does better, males or females. But we took a random sample, so we randomly choose the males and randomly choose the females. The individuals in the female sample do not dictate which units or individuals are the males that are chosen in the second sample. Okay, and so. This is what we'll be focusing, on, focusing in on, is where we have independent samples where one, the individuals in one sample do not dictate the individuals in the second sample. Okay? So now let's talk about hypothesis testing. Let's review hypothesis testing. This is the very first hypothesis, uh, or, or the, the uh, steps to do a hypothesis test. And this is where we dealt with uh, one mean sigma known. And so first we stated the known alternative hypothesis for that. Then we computed a test statistic, but with the one mean uh, sigma known, this was, it was basically using a z-score. Then from that z-score, we went to the applet. Since the applet represents a z-distribution, we went to the applet to get our, our p-value. And then if then we reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than the level of significance. If not, then we don't reject. And then we state our conclusions based on whether or not we rejected the null hypothesis. If we reject the null, we have sufficient evidence to say that, and then we say the alternative in English. If we don't reject the null, we have insufficient evidence to say that, and then we state the alternative in English. Okay? And then we dealt with matched pairs, or, or excuse me, not ma matched pairs, but uh, one means sigma unknown. Okay? We'll get to matched pairs in a review, matched pairs in a sec. But basically, with one means sigma unknown, we, uh, we also stated the known alternative hypotheses. We computed a test statistic. But then we also got a degrees of freedom as well as a p-value. We got degrees of freedom because we need to know the degrees of freedom because we're dealing with a t-distribution. But for all of these, these, two, these three steps, steps two through four, or two through four, we use either Excel or SPSS depending on which class you're in. But then the last two steps is the same as the, the last two steps in the previous one. We reject the null if the p-value is less than alpha. If not, we don't reject, and then if we re and then in our conclusions, if we reject the null, we have sufficient evidence to say that, and then we state the alternative in English. If we don't reject, we have insufficient evidence to say that, and then we state the alternative in English. Okay? So then we got to, and this is where we dealt with match pairs. This is how we define the known alternative hypotheses for match pairs. Okay? Here's the null, where the mean of the difference is equal to zero. And the alternative is that the mean of the difference is either less than zero, greater than zero, if it's a one-sided test, or not equal to zero, if it's a two-sided test. Okay? And then steps two through four, we use the software as well to get that. And then the last two steps are the same. We reject the null if the p-value is less than alpha. If not, we don't reject. And then we state our conclusions based on whether or not we reject the null hypothesis. Okay? So now we're going to talk about independent samples, and this is going to be the, uh, for dealing with hypothesis testing. So, so there's going to be six steps, six steps that we'll be doing, uh, doing with independent samples. It's similar to the six steps that we've done did with matched pairs, as well as a, a one mean sigma unknown. It's the same. It's really the same six steps, but now how we define the null and alternative hypothesis is different, or the hypotheses is different. The null is is that mu one is equal to U2, meaning the population mean of group 1 is equal to the population mean of group 2. The alternative is that the, the population mean of group 1 is not equal to the population mean of group 2 if we're doing a two-sided test, or the population mean of group 1 is greater than the population mean of uh, group 2, or the population mean of group 1 is less than the population mean of group 2. It 
depends on the test, whether we're doing a two-sided test like we're doing here, or a one-sided test, either a right-sided or a left-sided test. Then steps two through four, we do the same thing. We compute a test statistic, determine the degrees of freedom, and get a p-value. This is the formula for getting a test statistic, but basically you'll be using software, whether Excel or SPSS, to get your test statistic. But the same last two steps are the same. We either reject the null or not. If the p-value is less than alpha, we reject. And if, if it's greater than, we don't reject. And then we state our conclusions based on whether or not we reject the null hypotheses. Okay? So let's go through a couple of examples using independent samples. And both of these examples are on the online textbook. Okay? So researchers led by Arlene Butts published a study on reading practices of children. They wanted to know if there was a difference in the reading practices of children with developmental or behavioral problems. The dev group, or group one, compared to the children in the general population who did not have developmental problems, the gen group, or group two. One of the factors they considered was the number of nights each week the children participated in reading at home. Data represented of their results are given in the file reading practices, and there's a link to it on the online textbook. And then they use a level of significance of 0.05. Okay. They wanted to see if, the, if the, uh, the number of nights in each week the children participate in reading at home, whether or not there is a difference. Okay. So the step one is, is that state the null and alternative hypotheses. So the null is, is that the, the population mean of group one, which is, say, the developmental group, is equal to the population mean of group two, which is the general group or the, from the general population. The alternative is that the, those, those population means are not equal, okay? Now, where we get steps two through four is from software. Now, I have an example of this soft, uh, awesome output in SPSS. You would see this same output in Excel. But this is, so we're going to use the bottom row. Now, there's two rows. The equal variance is assumed and not assumed. Suffice it to say that because it's always right to use equal variance is not assumed, we're going to use equal variance is not assumed. And this is where we get the test statistic degrees of freedom and our p-value. Now for SPSS, this is our if it's a two-sided test, which this problem is, then we would this would be our p-value. So this is our test statistic degrees of freedom and our p-value. Okay. And so now, first of all, if we look at this 1.455, that means that 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 our result is 1.455 standard deviations away from the null hypothesis. Would this be a rare event or an unusual event? Well, that, well, it probably isn't, but the way to check it ultimately is to look at the p-value, okay? And our p-value is 0 0.147, okay? So, but now, compared to our level of significance, this is where we ultimately check to see whether or not it's an unusual value. Since our, since our p-value is greater than level of significance, 0 0.147 is greater than 0 0.05, therefore we don't reject the null hypothesis, and therefore we have insufficient evidence to say that there is a difference in the mean number of nights each week that children participated in reading in the home between the two groups. Okay. Now let's go through the second example. If you want to, you can stop the stop the recording here, uh, or stop the video and do it yourself. And there's there's uh, do the six steps. Okay. So here here's the problem. Here this is a fun problem. The, uh, the FIFA World Cup of Soccer is held every four years, and one of the biggest sporting events in the world. In 2006. Germany hosted the World Cup. A study was conducted by Dr. Wilbert Lampen uh, et al., which means others who were involved, to determine if the stress of doing a soccer match would increase the risk of the heart attack of another cardiovascular event. We'll use the data on cardiovascular problems during the World Cup to test the hypotheses that the mean number of cardiovascular events is greater than during the World, War, during the World Cup than during the control period. Let group one be the days in the control period, let group two represent days during the 2006 World Cup, and we'll use a level significance of alpha equal to 0.01. So what I'm going to do is, is that this would be a good time, if you haven't, to try to grab this data from the online textbook and go through the six steps of doing independent samples. And then when we get to part two of this video, we will go through the answers to, our, to uh, this problem. 